Thank you again for having me, and do turn up Matthew's Gospel, where we're going to look at chapter 15, verses uh, 10 to 20. And as you turn there, let me ask you a question, if I may. I wonder if you've ever met anyone famous, or is there someone famous that you'd like to meet, perhaps? Uh, Maybe a sporting legend, someone in a famous band, maybe royalty, uh, a member of parliament. Well, if you have, I wonder how you felt when you were with them. And if you haven't, I wonder how you think you would feel. Would you be on your best behaviour, keen to make a good impression? Well, today we're going to compare how Jesus responds to influential people with how the disciples respond to them. We're going to read uh, the first 20 verses of chapter 15 so that we can see our passage in context. Matthew 15, verses 1 to 20. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honour thy father and mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites. Well, did as I prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, But that which cometh out of the man, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth, entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Let's pray together. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. That the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, 
and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to consider this passage in two sections, uh, which are as follows. Number one, please God, not man. And we're looking there particularly at verses 10 to 15. And secondly, we'll consider the problem of the human heart, verse 16 to 20. So our first point then, please God, not man, verse 10 to 14. And that's what Jesus does in this passage. The disciples, on the other hand, do the opposite. They please man, not God. As we've just heard in the passage before, the Pharisees and the scribes accuse Jesus of breaking the tradition of the elders. Now remember, the Pharisees and the scribes were the religious authorities of the day. Everyone looked up to them. When they spoke, people listened. But despite their position, despite their influence, Jesus isn't worried about keeping them happy. He sees straight through them. He sees their proud, unteachable hearts, and that they're only there to try and pick holes. And because he's concerned with pleasing God, not man, he rebukes them. It's a solemn warning to us. If you come to Jesus with a proud heart, sitting above his teaching, it will not go well for you. Jesus turned their accusation back on the Pharisees and scribes and said, by keeping the commandments of men, you are in fact breaking the commandment of God. God commands you to honour your father and mother. But instead of looking after them and providing for them, you've invented this man-made tradition, this loophole, whereby you, you pledge your money to God so that you look all holy on the outside, and then you just keep it for yourselves. You hypocrites, he says. The word literally means actors. You actors. You're, you're just putting on a show, a performance, outward rituals and practices, while your hearts are far from God. Verse 8, these people... Honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now keep that in mind, because Jesus is going to address that issue in today's passage. And then as we come to our passage, what does he do? Well, he turns away from the Pharisees and the scribes. He turns away from the important and the influential. And verse 10, he calls the multitude. He summons the crowd. And he told them, listen and understand. So he turns his back on the religious leaders. He turns his back on these influential and important people. And he speaks instead to the crowd. And he says, don't be like them. Instead, listen and understand. Don't allow the words to go in one ear and out the other. Take them on board. Understand what they mean for you. Don't ignore them. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Well, that, of course, is very much the heart of the passage, and we'll consider what it means in a, in a short while. But what I want you to notice first is that even though, as verse 15 shows, the disciples don't understand what Jesus means. Look at what they do in verse 12. Then the disciples came up and told him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard this statement? Have a think about what's going on here. Jesus has just rebuked the Pharisees and scribes. He's called them hypocrites who overturn the commands of God with their man-made rules. But in spite of this, the disciples are worried about Jesus offending them. They come up to him and say, do you realize you've offended the Pharisees by saying this stuff about, about what comes out of your mouth 
defiling you. They didn't want the Pharisees to go away upset at anything Christ had said. And of course, at one level, that sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? We want everyone who hears the words of Christ not to be offended. We want them to realize the words, the, the wisdom of those words, and to, to worship him. But think about what the disciples are saying here. Come on, Jesus. That sounded a little bit harsh. You're going to lose the religious leaders here. Could you maybe rephrase it to soften the blow a bit? Clear up any confusion? Matthew Henry writes, surely, they think, if Jesus had considered how provoking it would be, he, he wouldn't have said it. That's their train of thought, isn't it? Like we easily get in the presence of somebody important, the disciples are more concerned with pleasing man than pleasing God, and they're more concerned about nice words than about the truth. Have a listen to Jesus' response in verse 13. He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father did not plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. You see, Jesus simply isn't in the game of keeping people happy. He doesn't say, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. What was it they didn't like? Or have you got any ideas on, on how I could put things differently? He doesn't play along with the madness that our society says, that if someone feels offended, then that means that an offense has taken place. He says, the Pharisees are blind guides. Leave them alone. Don't try and please the Pharisees because they haven't been planted by my heavenly Father. Jesus pulls back the veil on the spiritual reality of the situation. There are two types of people. Some who are planted by God, and others who are not. And he says that it's only those who have been planted by God who will receive his word and not be offended. Well, I think that's a helpful reminder for us too, isn't it? The word of God will not please everyone. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't choose our words carefully, but it is a fool's errand to play the game of trying to keep everyone happy. Calvin writes, we ought to take care that so far as may be in our power, our manner of teaching shall give no offense, that it would be the height of madness to think of exercising greater moderation than we have been taught to do by our heavenly master. This, by the way, gives us a clue about what Jesus might say about the modern idea of shaping church services around the outsider. Well, don't hear me wrong here. I'm not saying that we shouldn't put on good coffee, try and provide a, a welcoming and friendly atmosphere. But we must resist the temptation to strip out everything from a church service that could possibly offend someone who isn't a Christian. Or in your conversations, do you ever find yourself trying to downplay the, the less palatable parts of the Bible or the gospel? Do you ever try to explain away the plain teaching of Jesus? Do you yourself even find it uncomfortable when someone teaches something just a little bit too plainly for your liking? Because let's be clear, there's any number of Jesus' teachings that aren't very popular these days. Jesus says marriage is for a man and a woman. Surely love is love. 
Jesus says our sin is so serious it deserves punishment for eternity. It's not, let's not talk about hell. That's, that's offensive. The Bible says the world was created in six days. But no right-thinking person believes that anymore. Jesus says he alone is Lord. And that when earthly authorities call us to disobey his word, our allegiance must be to him first and foremost. But Jesus couldn't have known what it would be like for us in the 21st century. Jesus says that Sunday is the Lord's day should be set aside for him. But that's not really going to work for me. I, I, I've got too much to do. The question is this, are we more concerned with pleasing God or pleasing man? Jesus says you've got two types of plant. You're either planted by God or, or you're not. And you're not going to please the ones that God has not planted and what's more, what's going to happen to the plants that weren't planted by God? Verse 13, they'll be rooted up. For a time, they might look like all the other plants. But a day is coming when they'll be ripped out of the ground. At the end of last summer, my wife and I reworked one of the flower beds in our garden. We, we pulled out some large shrubs that had been there for years and had grown too big for the flower bed. We offered them to some friends for their garden, but we knew that from the moment they were out of the ground, the clock was ticking. So we, we watered the roots lots, and, and we got them back into the ground as soon as we could to give them the best chance of surviving. Well, I looked at this uh, shrub that we took round just the other day, and I have to say it's not looking very happy. When you pull a plant out of the ground, even within a few short hours, its leaves begin to wither, its roots dry out, and it dies. And that's the picture of what will happen to any plants not planted by God. Sometimes it happens within this earthly life, before our eyes. Their rejection of God's word leads to works of the flesh, and they're recognized for who they are. But even if it doesn't, it will happen on the last day when the Lord returns to judge. And those who weren't planted by him will be pulled out of the life-giving ground. Either way, Jesus says, let them alone. Don't concern yourselves with them. As someone put it, neither court their favor nor dread their displeasure. Care not, though they be offended. They are wedded to their own fancies and will have everything their own way. Seek not to please a generation of men that please not God and will be pleased with nothing, nothing less than absolute dominion over your consciences. The case of those sinners is sad indeed, whom Christ orders his ministers to let alone. You know, even as I say this, I might be offending people who are sat here right now. If you're not a believer, please know I'm not trying to offend you. Simply trying to explain what Christ says. But part of that is that the truth offends those who aren't planted by God. If you're a Christian, we need to remember that the teachings of Christ, the gospel, the scriptures in general, will cause offense. In fact, we could say the natural state of man is to take offense at the gospel. And that means that though we should take care not to cause offense unnecessarily, the only way to guarantee not offending is not to teach the truth. 
That's how to keep the world happy. And by the way, that's not something that happens overnight. As if you are teaching the full counsel of God one day and then the next, you teach the opposite. It happens by a series of small steps. Let's, let's steer away from, from that doctrine. It sounds a little bit strong in this day and age. Please God, not man, don't flip it around like the disciples did. Because while you're worried about pleasing man, you won't think about pleasing God. Remember, the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying. But they were so busy worrying about how the Pharisees might hear what Jesus was saying that they weren't listening for themselves. They sat over the word instead of sitting under it. Now we can see, can't we, why Jesus began with that warning in verse 10. Listen and understand. They've been listening to Jesus' teaching through the ears of someone else. And in the process, they've actually failed to hear it for themselves. What's the danger of this way of operating? Have a look at the end of verse 14. The Pharisees are blind guides, and if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. You see, it's not only a waste of time trying to please men, it's also dangerous. If you concern yourself with trying to keep men happy, they'll actually lead you into a pit. Because they can't see. If you try to see everything through their eyes, you might succeed. And before you know it, you'll be at the bottom of a pit, finding Jesus' teaching offensive yourself. That's the danger that Jesus warns us of here. There is only one person who can see in this story, and that is Jesus. The Pharisees, the crowd, the disciples, they're all blind. The only way forward for anyone is to get behind a guide who can see. Again, don't hear me wrong here. None of this is to say that we shouldn't be concerned about those who aren't Christians, that we shouldn't go to great lengths to share the gospel with them, to serve them and love them. But we need to be more concerned with humbly listening to and understanding the word of God ourselves than with worrying about how it comes across to, otherwise, to, to others. Else we could end up in the pit ourselves. Someone has written, weak hearers are sometimes more worried than they should be not to have wicked hearers offended. But if we please men with the concealment of truth and the indulgence of their errors and corruptions, we are not the servants of Christ. Well, the disciples take on board Jesus' rebuke in verse 14. They realize that they haven't humbly listened and understood. And so verse 15, Peter comes to him. Peter replies to Jesus, explain this parable to us. He models what we should all do, doesn't he? He goes to the guide, the one who can see, and says, help me see. Remember, everyone is blind in the story. What, do, what sets the disciples out from the rest is that they realize it, and they come to Christ to be taught. Which brings us to our second point, the problem of the human heart. Verse 16, Jesus responds, are even you still lacking in understanding? Jesus gives Peter and the other disciples a gentle rebuke here. They, they've been with Jesus. They've heard him teach. 
They should have figured this out by now. Yet he doesn't leave them in this state. He goes on to explain verse 17. Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? He starts with a biology lesson. Any children amongst us, you all know this. When you put some food in your mouth, maybe a biscuit later on this evening or something, you chew it up and swallow it. What happens next? It goes down into your stomach. When your body starts to digest it, takes any goodness it can from it, gives you the energy that you need and all those things. But that's not the end of the journey for that bit of food, is it? Once your body has taken all the good stuff from it, it continues its journey through into your gut and bowel and stuff. And then in Jesus' words, it gets eliminated or expelled. In other words, you visit the toilet it's all quite funny, isn't it? But why is Jesus talking about this? Do his disciples need a biology lesson? Now look back, verse 11. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, Jesus says. Defile, make dirty. It's not what goes into the mouth that makes a man unclean. It's not what you eat that makes you a sinner. Certain foods don't make you unclean before God. Jesus is doing two things here. First, he's undermining all the extra rules that the Pharisees had added to the Old Testament law about what foods you you could and couldn't eat. But second, he was paving the way for the new covenant teaching where all foods were made clean. If Peter had listened properly at this point. He wouldn't have argued back in Acts chapter 10, would he? When he had the the vision of the different animals on the sheet and was told to kill and eat. Jesus says it's not what goes into the mouth that makes you a sinner. After all, what happens to the food you eat, it travels through your body and comes out the other side. It does not affect your soul. But, Jesus continues in verse 11, what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Why? Verse 18, because what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart, and this defiles a man. As someone has helpfully put it, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Do you know that? You know, we can't fix ourselves by tweaking a few things on the outside. New Year's resolutions, resolve, promises. Our problem runs so much deeper. If we're about not eating certain foods, we might not like it, but we could probably just about manage it. That's the religion of the Pharisees. Don't eat this. Don't touch that. Verse 20, don't eat with unwashed hands and you'll be clean before God. But no, that's not it, is it? And if we're honest with ourselves, we know that's not it. Jesus says we have a much greater problem. Our hearts. Verse 19, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. Maybe you hear a list like that and you don't recognize yourself in it. It Sounds like a nasty description of a real piece of work. But listen again. Evil thoughts. We all have those. And they don't sound so bad, but actually they are the seeds that grow into everything else in the list. And besides, is it really okay if we only sin in our hearts? Of course not. Our hearts are the very core of who we are. And God sees them. He cares about them. 
He's not interested in some external fake goodness that we put on ourselves, like some kind of costume. He sees our evil thoughts. He knows them. He, he says they come from our rotten hearts. When did you last have an evil thought? When did you last hate your brother? Have a thrill of pleasure when you saw someone experience misfortune? about murders? I'm guessing most of us haven't killed anyone. But think about what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. When did you last wish someone off the face of the planet? When did you last let loose at someone and murder them with your words? Adulteries. When were you last unfaithful in your heart towards your husband or wife? Sexual immoralities. When did you allow your mind to wander and indulge in some fantasy that goes against the law of God? Thefts. Children, when did you last steal from your brother or sister? When did you last take their stuff and use it for yourself? When did you last cheat someone? False testimonies. Children, again, when did you last tell a story to your parents and exaggerate your brother's sin and left yourself in the story as a wronged and innocent victim? Grown-ups, have you been careful with your thoughts and words about others not to slander them unfairly, either silently in your own mind or out loud to another? And blasphemies. When did you last think ill of God? When did you last think he was unfair because of some difficulty in your life? When did you last think or speak of God as if he were anything other than the perfection of goodness and grace to his enemies? You see, we're all guilty before such a list. And Jesus says that these issues, they arise from rotten hearts. The heart is the corrupt fountain from which all our moral defilement flows. Imagine a spring on a mountainside with water flowing out from it. Imagine if you try to stop the water coming out. Maybe just run up and sort of try to shove your hands into the hillside where the water's emanating from. Get some friends to help as well. What would happen? Well, the pressure would, would build and the, and the water would just find another way to escape. You see, by nature, our hearts pour forth sin continually. Perhaps you make a real effort not to lust after others and suddenly you find yourself gossiping instead. You try to curb your tongue in this area and the next moment you're full of pride. You try to think little of yourself and it's not long before you're, you're bursting out in anger. This is the deal with a fountain or a spring. By nature, our hearts pour forth sin. Listen and understand, says Jesus. You've got a heart problem. Your heart is cancerous. You need surgery. You need a heart transplant. No wonder that he says, don't bother trying to please the Pharisees. You see, there's no way of making this teaching palatable, is there? There's no way of making it sound nice. Jesus says your problem goes to the very core of your being. You need a new heart. But thankfully, that's just what is on offer. Because there is one whose heart isn't like this. Jesus' heart is different. His heart was a fountain, but a fountain that poured forth the fruit of the Spirit that we read that we read about in Galatians 5. You know, try as you might to stop it. His heart continually produced love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Yet he went to the cross as if he had a rotten heart like ours. But as Galatians 5 verse 24 continues... 
Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. When Jesus went to the cross, he was, so to speak, he was entering a surgical theater. He went to have a heart transplant to give away his heart and to receive ours. If we recognize our sin, recognize the darkness of our hearts and put our trust in him, then the Bible says that our flesh has been crucified with Christ on the cross. Our darkened hearts, our defiled hearts have been replaced with new hearts. Christ was treated on the cross as our rotten hearts deserved. And we are treated as his pure heart deserves. We are wonderfully forgiven. And because our flesh has been crucified with its passions and desires, we are no longer stuck in that continuing cycle of a fountain of evil pouring out sin continually. Because by the power of Christ's Spirit, we can produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love instead of hatred and murder. Faithfulness instead of adulteries. Giving instead of stealing. Kind words instead of false testimonies and blasphemies. If you haven't yet put your trust in Christ, you can do so even now. Please don't harden your heart to what you heard this evening. Rather, listen and understand. Christ knows you. He knows your heart. And he went to the cross for you. Turn to him for forgiveness and cleansing. If you already have put your trust in Christ, then turn afresh to him today. Remember that your flesh has been crucified with Christ, along with its passions and desires. So you don't have to continue to pour forth sin anymore. By the Spirit's help, turn from your sin and bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Let's pray for God to do that work in us now. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for going to the cross for us. Lord, we thank you that, that our flesh with its passions and desires have been crucified at the cross with you. Since we live by the Spirit, help us please to follow the Spirit. Might we be those who bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Might we celebrate that we have been freed from captivity to sin. By your spirit, might we be those who walk in faithfulness and honor you with what we think, say, and do. Lord Jesus, we also pray for any here who do not yet know you as Savior. Please would they be those who have been planted by your heavenly Father, and so would they not take offense, but instead receive the word with joy? Lord, by your spirit, would you grant them saving faith? Would you convict them of their sin that goes so much deeper than the surface? And would you give them new hearts, Lord? Please, even now, bring salvation for your own glory. And we pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. We're going to sing in response to what we've just heard, hymn number 604. Love divine, all loves excelling.
close with these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. <clears throat> and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen.